Hey, how you doing again today? Yesterday we talked about the road, Romans Road to Salvation. You got yourself a uh, prayer at the end of it to uh, take part in that salvation for the rest of your life. If you believe in your heart, make Jesus Christ your Savior. Believe He's the Son of the God, and He's risen, and He's seated by the right hand of God for us today, and He saved us from our sin of unbelief. So we can have eternal life. Let's talk today a little bit about the message of the cross. And it's been put on as if not everybody doesn't know how to do, what to do, the way they say it. So, the message of the cross, four parts to it, is really simple. And this is for us that are saved and those that want to be saved, you go back and not watch the Romans Road of the uh, salvation, simple salvation, you want to call it, and then this will work for you as well. <clears throat> Best of the cross basically is Jesus Christ. He is the source of all blessings. Number two, the cross of Christ is the means to which all blessings are given. Now, I'm talking about the wooden beam, but therefore what he did at that cross. The cross now, number three, the cross of Christ as our object of faith. That means, that's the means by which the blessings are received, by faith. Everything in the Bible is received by faith. And number four, with that faith placed and anchored in the cross of Christ, what he did there, the Holy Spirit then it superintends all of this. Now I've got some scriptures we'll go over. Let's start out with number one. We'll go with John uh, 1 and 1, 14 and 29. I'm going to pull them up here in the Expositor's Bible. And it's talking about the uh, deity of Christ. In the beginning, does not infer that Christ has God had a beginning because as God, he had no beginning, but rather refers to the time of creation, Genesis 1 and 1. So in the beginning was the Word. Now the Holy Spirit through John described Jesus as the eternal logos. That's another word. Word and the Word was with God. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. You see how Jesus Christ is the source. The Word was with God, was in relationship with God, and expressed the idea of the Trinity Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Godhead three in one. And the Word was God, meaning that He did not cease to be God during the Incarnation. He was and is God from eternity past and eternity to eternity future. Let's skip over to chapter, uh, verse 14. Verse 14 here says, And the Word, talking about Jesus, was made flesh. So the Word with God and was God and now he's made flesh it refers to the incarnation God becoming man and dwelt among us that refers to Jesus although perfect not holding himself aloft from all others but rather lived as all men even a, a peasant and be and we beheld his glory glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So he dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So that right there, it tells you what we talked about yesterday. He is the Son of God. He is the Word, become flesh as man. He is the Son of God. And we beheld his glory glory as of the only begotten of the Father. The only one you call Father is God in heaven. And that speaks of his deity, Jesus' deity. Although hidden from the eyes of many, of merely curious, who Christ laid aside the expression of his deity. So he laid that deity aside and he became man. Now he was sinless, sin didn't have our DNA. 
He never lost possession of his deity. And now he is full of grace and truth. So, begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The truth shall set you free. Truth, as flesh proclaim his humanity, grace and truth his deity. So let's scoot over here to 29 like we were talking about. Still working on number one, Jesus is the source. Alright, the next day refers to the day after John had been questioned by emissaries from Sanhedrin. John sees Jesus coming unto him and no doubt after the baptism of Jesus and the temptation in the wilderness and said behold the Lamb of God so here he is he's the word the word made flesh God's son his only begotten son given to us he set aside his deity he was a spotless lamb so behold the Lamb of God this proclaims Jesus as the sacrifice for sin in fact the sin offering whom all the multiple millions of offered lambs and he had, re had represented, which takes away the sin of the world. He's the only one. Only Jesus could take away the sin of the world. No animal blood could not ever cover, could only cover sin. It could not take it away. But Jesus offered himself, and the perfect sacrifice took away the sin of the world. He not only cleansed the acts of sin, but as well address the root cause. You'll find that in Colossians 2, 14, 15. you got to get yourself an expository Bible from jsm.org. I can also put on links where we've been uh, giving away the Bibles, as well as donations. So let's go to Colossians 2 and 10. Let's check that out. Boom, hit the button. I'm in Colossians 2 and 10 now. And it says, I'm going to put go to 9. For in him, Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. This is the Godhead as to essence. Christ is the completion and the fullness of deity. And in him, the believer, the believer, that's us believer is complete. How about that? We are complete in him. We need for nothing because he is the source. Now number 10. And you are complete in him. So we are, we are complete in him. In him the believer is complete. So and you are complete in him. In him means we believe in him. He is our savior. He is in us. We are in him. Because we believe, simple faith placed in what he did on the cross. The satisfaction of every spiritual one is found in Christ, made possible by the cross. Not the wooden beam, but by the act that he did. He took our sins when he died. And he came, his, he had the place, the faith to die for us. That's what he came for which is the head of all principality and power. And you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. His headship extends not only over the church, which voluntarily serves him, but over all forces that are opposed to him as well. So let's go back up here and see where we're at. So that was uh, 10 through 15. Got to keep on trucking. Number 11. In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. So the Old Testament talks about circumcision with the knife and cutting the foreskin off an eight day old baby. And he is circumcised. That's the Jewish tradition. We're circumcised with Christ with the circumcision made without hands. That's him dying on the cross. That which is brought about by the cross. Romans 6, 3 through 5. We're going to go to that in a minute. That is a very, probably one of the most important 
things to know as a follower of Christ, a Christian, and where you stand with God. And that it all happened when you got saved and born again. We'll go over that in a minute. Made without hands, in putting off the body of sins, of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision. So, of Christ. It's a circumcision of Christ. Refers to the old carnal nature that is defeated by the believer placing his faith totally in the cross, which gives the Holy Spirit latitude to work. The Holy Spirit will not work for you any other way unless your faith is totally, totally anchored in that sacrifice of the cross. We're buried with him in baptism. Now, this does not refer to water. Everybody see baptism, they say, oh, water. In the Greek and in the Hebrew, you have to get a strong dictionary and see what it actually is talking about. Total immersion. Baptism is just total immersion. It can be in water. It can be in ketchup. It can be totally immersed in barbecue sauce. It just means totally immersed. In this case here, we are buried with him in baptism. We are baptized, totally immersed into Christ. It does not refer to water baptism, but rather the believer baptized into the death of Christ, which refers to the crucifixion of Christ as our substitute. And remember, I talked about Romans 6, 3 through 5. That's the important thing. You need to know where you are. When you, when you got saved, when yesterday when you said that prayer a minute in your heart, you asked Jesus to be your Savior. You, right there, you were baptized into Christ, not water. You were baptized into the crucifixion of Christ as our substitute. Wherein also you are risen with him through the faith. Remember we say faith. You are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. The faith of the operation of God. The faith of the operation of God. None of works, not us, of God. This is his design. This is his prescribed order of victory. Through the faith and the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead. Remember, we died to ourselves yesterday when we became born again. And now we are raised with Jesus from the dead, a new creation. This does not refer to our future physical resurrection, but to the spiritual resurrection from the sinful state to divine life. There it is. We died with him, we are buried with him, and we rose with him. That's Romans 6 through 3 through 5. We died with him, we were buried with him, and we rose with them. And in 6, 3 through 5, it's no need not. You are baptized into his death. You are baptized in his burial. And you are baptized into his resurrection. We died with him. We are buried with him. And we rose with him. And herein lies the secret to all spiritual victory. This is the prescribed order of victory. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, this speaks of a spiritual death, i.e. separation from God. That's, that's what we speak of. You're dead. You're separated from God. Has, a, has he quickened together with him, refer to being made spiritually alive, which is done through being born again spiritually alive to being born again. So we died. The old man died. The old self. The old bud died. And now I'm alive. Born again. Alive in Christ. Having forgiven you all trespasses, the cross made it possible for all manner of sins to be forgiven and taken away. That's the key thing. We got forgiveness before in the Old Testament, now they're taken away. Number 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, 
pertaining to the law of Moses, which was God's standard of righteousness that man could not reach. We couldn't reach it. We can't reach that standard of righteousness. Which was contrary to us. So he blotted out. When Jesus died, he blotted out all handwriting the ordinances that was against us. Which was contrary to us. That was the law against us simply because we are unable to keep its precepts no matter how hard we try notice we try we fail we try we fail we gave faith in the one that did it we win victory and he took it out of the way that refers to the penalty of the law being removed nailing it to his cross the law with its decrees was abolished in Christ's death as if crucified with him. So, when we were born again, we died with Jesus, we were buried with Jesus, we rose again with Jesus, alive in Christ. That means being alive in Christ. And that means that we are crucified with him. And having spoiled principalities and powers, this is Satan and all of his henchmen were defeated at the cross by Christ, atoning for all sin. <clears throat> sin was a legal right Satan had to hold man in captivity. With all sin atoned, he has no more legal right to hold anyone in bondage. He, Christ, made a show of them openly. So in having small principalities and powers, he, in Christ, made a show of them openly. What Jesus did at the cross was in the face of the whole universe, tromping over them in it. The triumph was is complete, and it was all alone, all done for us, meaning we can walk in power and perpetual victory due to the cross. Anytime you're feeling depressed or what have you coming at you, you know you got this stronghold on the devil right here through Christ, your faith in Christ. So that was the Colossians. Let's go on number two now. That was Jesus Christ. Now you see how he's the source. Now we're going to talk about the cross of Christ. What he did the mean is the means. It's the means by which all the blessings are coming. So Here's the mechanism. It's the cross. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 1, 17, 18. And I'm going to get it here in the Exposure Bible. Bear with me. I love this. I love this thing, man. 1, 17, 18. 1, 17, 18. Now, I emphasize this because so many people they get to uh, Romans chapter 6 they see the word baptized and it's all over. Hey, you get Jesus wrong, the whole Bible's wrong. And the whole Bible is a story of Jesus Christ and crucified and the whole story of Jesus Christ and crucified is the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Alright, 1 to 17 When I therefore was thus minded did I use likeness. I don't think I'm in the right book. Not the one, but first one. Seventeen. There you go. Bear with me. There it is, Paul. Paul was Saul. We'll go over that later on another time if you don't know who Paul was or what Paul became. And he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize. See, he was born again, had a relationship with Christ. And then Paul wrote the 14 epistles in the book. So, for Christ sent me, meaning Paul, not to baptize, presents to us a cardinal truth, but to preach the gospel, the manner in which one may be saved from sin. Not with the wisdom of words, intellectualism is not the gospel lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. This tells us in no uncertain 
terms that the cross of Christ must always be the emphasis of the message. Wisdom. Number 18. For the preaching or the message of the cross. The preaching of the cross is to them who perish foolishness. The ones that didn't want to get saved. They don't want to believe. They perish. They're foolish. Spiritual things cannot be discerned by unredeemed people. But that doesn't matter. The cross must be preached just the same and even as we shall see. So here we are. For the preaching of the cross, the message we're talking about right now, the message of the cross, is to them who perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved, born again. It is the power of God. It is the power of God. The cross is the power of God simply because it was there that the total sin that was paid, giving the Holy Spirit in whom the power resides, latitude to work mightily in our lives. That's the power source, the Holy Spirit. Let me go to 23, and then we'll go to 2 2. Flipping pages. Hear? Can't hear? Ha! Ah. Here it is, Paul. But we preach Christ. And you can preach about Jesus all day long. Meditate on Jesus all day long. Here's the kicker. Crucified. He does not depart. You can't separate cross, uh, Christ from the cross. But we preach Christ crucified. This is the foundation of the word of God and thereby of salvation. We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews. So just, you could say, the religious people, because they're stuck in religion. Us, who are saved, we have a relationship with Christ through his crucifixion. We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, and it's a stumbling block. A stumbling block. The cross was a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, it's foolishness to them. Both found it difficult to accept as God, a dead man hanging on the cross, for such Christ was to them. So you got the religion, Jews, and the religious Greeks. You know what the whole main problem is? Pride. Pride is the root of all sin. That's how we got in this mess we're in when Adam ate the fruit, is pride. Let's go to 29, or uh, 2 and 2 here. Chapter 2 and 2. Here's Paul talking again. For I determined not to know anything among you. With the purpose and design, Paul did not report to the knowledge of the, or philosophy of the world regarding the preaching of the gospel. Save Jesus Christ and am crucified. For I determined not to know anything among you Save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's all we are to know. And that alone is the message which will save the sinner, set the captive free, and give the believer perpetual victory. For I determined not to know. That's what we've got to get in our head. No matter what you see on TV, whatever, determined not to know anything among you. Save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And that gives the believer perpetual victory. Let's go over here to number three here. The cross of Christ as our object of faith. This is the means by which all blessings are received. With the cross of Christ, our means of blessing are received. So here we are. I'm going to go to Romans 6, 3 through 5 we're talking about. Let's head over there and then back to Colossians and Ephesians. Romans 6, 3 through 5. This is, this is the key. This is the key to the, to the whole deal right here. This is what we talked about. Because this is us. This is, how, this is what God sees us. Only, only, only if your faith is anchored in, in what he did. 
Paul says here, Know ye not that so many of us were baptized, see there's the word baptized, not water, into Jesus Christ. So when we got saved the other day, or 20 years ago, or the ones that get saved tomorrow, they're going to be baptized into Jesus Christ. So the Spirit, the Holy Spirit pulls us. He gave you that inkling that, hey, I know I'm a sinner. I've done wrong. God's right. I believe Jesus died for me. He is the Son of God, and He is by the right hand of the Father at this time, and I ask Him and make Him come into my heart, live within me. That's the Holy Spirit pulling us to give us that conviction or that condemnation because they were condemned. We were condemned to a sentence of death, separation from God forever, until that Holy Spirit gave you that pull, and in your heart and soul, you believe. And it says here, when you did that, he baptized us into Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit baptized us in Jesus Christ. Know you not that so many of us as we're baptized in Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. So let's go back here. Plainness says that the baptism in the Christ is into Christ and not water. And they get list off a bunch of uh, scriptures here. If you want to write them down, look them up. 1 Corinthians 1.17 1 Corinthians 12.13 Galatians 3.27 Ephesians 4, 5, Colossians 2, 11, 13. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. When Christ died on the cross, in the mind of God, we died with him. In other words, he became our substitute, and our identification with him in his death gives us all, gives us all the benefits, all the benefits for which he died. The idea is that he did it for all for us. So he did it, he gives all the benefits, and he did it all for us. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptized baptism into death. Not only did we die with him, but we were buried with him as well. Which means that all the sin and transgressions of the past were buried. They're gone. They're buried. Don't dig them up. People dig them up, throw them at you. No, they're buried. That devil's going to pick them up and he's going to say, Look what you did. You remember you did that? No, I'm saved. They're buried, it says right here. Therefore we are buried with him by the baptism into his death. And him as well, which means that all the sin and transgression of the past were buried. When they put him in the tomb, Jesus, they put him in the tomb, they put all our sins into that tomb as well. Hallelujah. Man, we're free. Oh, man. That like... As Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. You're a new man. You're a child. You're a new child of God. You're born again. Let's read it one time without the notes. Therefore we are we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. We died with him, we were buried with him, and his resurrection was our resurrection to a newness of life. We got a new life. You talk about a second chance. I mean, we messed it up long enough. Everybody ought to get, get that. They got to get that. Let's go. Uh, it's telling me number five also. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, 
we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So let's read it with the notes. For if we have been planted together, we, looking back to the cross, are planted together as if the man stood right here. With Christ in in the likeness of his death, Paul proclaims the cross as the instrument through which all blessings come. Consequently, the cross must ever be the object of our faith, which gives the Holy Spirit latitude to work within our lives. We shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. We're we're going to resurrect when He comes back for us at the rapture. That's another story. We'll We'll hit that too. We can have the likeness of his resurrection, i.e. live this resurrection life, only as long as we understand the likeness of his death, which refers to the cross as the means by which all of this is done. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, Jesus, all that were we were before conversion, that the body of sin might be destroyed, the power of the sin nature. Now we'll have to get into what that means. The sin. They took the the out of it. There's only one time when this, when we talk about sin in chapter 6, there's one time in verse 15 it talks about the act of sin. These destroyed power of the sin nature made ineffective. That henceforth we should not serve sin, not serve the sin, the sin nature. The guilt of the sin is removed at the conversion because the sin nature no longer rules within our lives our hearts so we're going to talk touch that in a second hold that thought let's get through about the cross being a means by all blessings received we got to go to Colossians 2 14 15 I think we already read that but we're going to read it again I hope I'm not boring you but I figured out what to do with my free time <laughs> while I'm sitting on waiting on a load. Let's see, 14 and 15. Here it is again, blotting out all handwriting and ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and power, he, Christ, made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. That's what happened at the cross. Right there. Triumphed over it. Ephesians 2, 13, 18. We're still talking about the cross of Christ as our object of faith, the means by which it is received. Ephesians 2, 13 through 18. Let's see here. Ephesians 2. Christ is our peace 
through Christ and what he did. Come on, get off the phone. <laughs> through Christ and what he did at the cross, we have peace with God. Who made, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us? Meaning, through Christ and what he did at the cross, we have peace with God. And who has made both one, Jews and Gentiles? We're Gentiles, we're not Jews here. And has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, between Jews and Gentiles, having abolished in his flesh, speaking of his death on the cross, by which he redeemed humanity, which also means he didn't die spiritually, as some claim. The enmity, he didn't die spiritually. Heaven bosses in his flesh the enmity, the hatred between God and man caused by sin, even the law. Commandments contained in ordinances for to make himself in himself a twain, one new man so making peace which again is accomplished by the cross let's see if we got that yeah 13 through 18 13 through 18 here we go 16 now and that he Christ might reconcile both Jews and Gentiles so we're included in that unto God in one body the church we're the body we are the church, not a building. By the cross, it is made. It is by the atonement only that man, that men ever become reconciled to God, having slain the enmity, thereby removing the barrier between God and sinful man, and came and preached peace to you which were far off, and to them who were nigh. Gentile, the gospel going to the Gentiles because they weren't allowed in the synagogues. And it refers to the Jews or nigh, the ones that were close. It is the same message for both. For through him, through Christ, we both, Jews and Gentiles, have access by one spirit unto the Father. If the sinner comes by the cross, the Holy Spirit opens the door Otherwise, it is barred. That's John 10 and 1. Awesome. So that right there wraps up the cross of Christ as our mean, our object of faith, and as the means by which all blessings are received. Let's get to number four, and then we'll quit. The Holy Spirit, He superintends all of this. And we're going to talk about the law here because this is very important 8, 1, 2, and 9 and 9 through 11 this is awesome this is awesome Romans we're almost done and then we'll talk about some other things another time but this is so important this is the most important thing right here there's two laws the law of spirit and life through Christ Jesus and the law of sin and death before conversion. You're controlled by the law of sin and death. And this is what Jesus said. This is what Paul writes to us. Happened after you became saved. So life in the spirit. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is now, there is therefore now no condemnation. No more not guilty anymore. You're sedated. You're judged not guilty when you came to Christ. Therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. This refers back to Romans 6, 3, and 5 where you buried, died with him, buried with him, rose with him. And are being baptized into his death which speaks of the crucifixion. Now there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit.
spirit. It guarantees the help of it. So, you are not guilty anymore. Because now you're in Christ. So when God sees you, he doesn't see you. He sees you through the blood because your faith is anchored in Jesus Christ and crucified. Therefore, he only sees you being born again, baptized in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That's what God sees. Though. Your faith remains in the cross and the crucifixion. So therefore, now there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ, because we're in Christ now, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The Holy Spirit works exclusively within the legal confines of the finished work of Christ. Our faith in that finished work, the cross guarantees the help of the Holy Spirit, which guarantees victory. And here comes the law. For the law of the Spirit of life. That's the most powerful law. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Can't be any other place. In Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The two most powerful laws in the universe. Get that? For the law, that which we are about to give is the law of God devised by the God in the eternity past. 1 Peter 1, 18 20 This law, in fact, is God's prescribed order of victory. For the law of the Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, the way the Spirit works, of life, all life comes from Christ, but through the Holy Spirit. John 16, 13-14 in Christ Jesus. Anytime Paul uses the term or one of his derivatives, he is without fail referring to what Christ did at the cross, which makes life this life possible. Has made me free, given me total victory from the law of sin and death. These are the two most powerful laws in the universe. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus alone is stronger than the law of sin and death. This means that if the believer attempts to live for God by any other than faith in Christ and the cross, he is doomed to failure. We've got one more scripture here, I think. 9 through 11. Then we'll button it up. Time. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, by faith in the cross, the only way it can happen. But the spirit of life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he who raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit who dwells in you. So let's do that. I'll read that one again. But if the Spirit, Holy Spirit, of Him from God, who raised up Jesus from from the uh, let me go back here to ten. And if Christ be in you, He's in you through the power and the person of the Spirit. Galatians two twenty. The body is dead because of sin. Because of sin, means that the physical body has been rendered helpless. Because of the fall, fall in the garden. Consequently, the believer trying to overcome by willpower presents a fruit task, fruitless task. But the spirit of life, because of righteousness, 
Only the Holy Spirit can make us what we ought to be, which means we cannot do it ourselves. Once again, he performs all that he does within the confines of the finished work of Christ. But if the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of him from God, who raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, and he definitely does, he who raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. Give us power in our mortal bodies that we might live a victorious life. By his spirit who dwells in you, we have the same power in us through the spirit that raised Christ from the dead and is available to us only on the premises of the cross and our faith in that sacrifice. Hallelujah. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. For do mortify the deeds of the body. So we must, we must, we must maintain our faith in Christ and what he did at the cross. I know my light's going down. It's getting dark outside. So I hope you enjoyed this. We're going to talk again about the sin nature and things like that. Have a blessed evening and a blessed day. And we will see you on the next one. Stay determined to know nothing of Christ and him crucified. And share these videos to those that you may think might 